Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. You've landed at the CAF COVID Weekly Roundup. My name's Jason Belden. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness for CAF. Uh, today is June 18th, uh, 2021, one o'clock in the afternoon. And today we'll cover the AFL that came out this week, as well as touch on a uh, KHAN alert. I wanna give you guys some information on the KHAN alert and uh, maybe some tools uh, that you can use for the upcoming uh, fire and extreme heat season. We'll talk about the Cal o OSHA ETS or emergency temporary standards. Those have been extended and signed into law by the governor. Uh, we'll, we'll cover uh, the differences um, in the extension and uh, we'll go over uh, some of the resources to help you if, if this falls, um, if, th if this applies for you guys. We'll talk about the NHSN reporting and what we've seen so far as well as a, a, a request from you guys to independently ver, verify your information. We'll get to that in a second. And we'll talk about um, validating uh, immunizations and how we do that in the care system. There was a, a, a press release this morning with a new uh, technology platform that's gonna greatly uh, assist us in being able to verify these um, um, immunization records. It's gonna be a lot better than, than what we've heard of previously. So we'll go over the old rules and then we'll talk about how you can uh, get the information pretty quickly. All right, I'm Jason Belden. I think I mentioned that already. Uh, Patty is on vacation today, good for her. Hopefully she enjoys her day off. Um, yeah, if I can. Goodness. Sorry guys, I had to show my screen because the, the other thing wasn't working, the other slides weren't working, but this is the same uh, slide deck. So hopefully you guys are able to see this. Can uh, can everybody see this or can you respond in the chat to make sure that you guys are able to see my screen with the title I can slide? see it, Jason. Okay, perfect. Okay, good deal. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. All right. So in terms of an introduction, this is our standard intro. Uh, speakers' opinions expressed are their own. They may not reflect CAF's official position or any of our grant funders' position, I should say. Um, this is a grant-funded program or these uh, webinars are a part of a grant-funded program. Um, that grant funds come from the Department of Public Health as well as uh, Los Angeles County EMS Agency. I have no personal financial conflicts and I'll be the only uh, speaker on this webinar. The intent of the webinars is to give you a situational report of what's happening in the week of COVID, um, as well as some forecasting and best practices where we can identify those. I, I'm hopeful that, um, that this uh, presentation won't take us too long because there wasn't a ton of changes and then I wanna leave time for questions. Um, and, and there was a really extensive FAQs that's gonna come out uh, from HSAG uh, regarding the questions that Dr. Epson and CDPH had prepared for the two uh, really large AFLs, 22.8 and the 53.4, I believe it is. Anyways, I'll go over those when we get to the question and answer session at the end. So AFL 2038.7, uh, this is considered the visitation AFL for all facilities and, and it you know, states all facilities at the top. But the, uh, the language in the AFL was, I, it was not very clear, but we have obtained clarity from CDPH in writing that essentially says, well, you know, it says all facilities, but we meant to say uh, that the SNFs and the ICFs have their own sector specific uh, guidance for visitation and they should continue to follow those uh, two of AFLs. They're both linked there. We, we've covered them both on these uh, webinars, but just so you know, those are still in effect. They didn't go by the wayside just because this AFL was issued and it says, uh, quote unquote, all facilities. Um, we saw Los Angeles County uh, come on the conference call yesterday and uh, Dr. Nye um, essentially said that uh, for all Los Angeles County, except for those in Pasadena and Long Beach, you have your own health department. So it may be different for you, but uh, within their uh, jurisdiction, they advise all the facilities, um, uh, 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 skilled nursing facilities to follow the current guidance until it has been updated. And then when it is updated, it will be updated at that uh, link there on the bottom. And that's the standard page um, for public health in Los Angeles County that has all of the 
requirements for skilled nursing facilities, uh, testing, visitation, uh, quarantine, all that good stuff is, is listed out there. So, all right. Let's talk about the, the second update that came out this week. Uh, you know, you didn't need an update to tell you it was super hot outside. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, you know, previously during COVID about the use of fans and the maximization of outdoor air to improve ventilation in your buildings. But when it's 110 or 115 degrees outside and uh, uh, fans are, are almost certainly going to be necessary to maintain a safe environment. And uh, if your outdoor air is still open on your HVAC units, you're going to have to probably, if you haven't already, you're going to have to close those and until the heat abates a little bit. I think what you'll find is if you leave those outdoor air open, you're not going to be able to cool the indoor temperatures of your building more than 20 or 25 degrees uh, what it is outside. So um, uh, you know, unless you have an you know incredibly new robust uh, HVAC system, it may be really difficult for you to maintain a safe level of care with those still open. So in in that instance, we've got to you know uh, we're going to have to you know figure out how we convert back and forth. You know, if you've got an active outbreak in your building, I don't think anybody is in this case now. I, you know, obviously you want to keep the ventilation open in that case uh, unless it presents a, a severe risk to the resident safety. But no matter what you do, um, you know, in this process, if you are you are using all of those methods to increase ventilation and you're seeing uh, that penalty in your indoor temperatures rising, you're gonna have to have one, a process to make sure that you understand what's going on in your building. Um, the indoor temps in resident rooms, if you're closing the doors, you definitely need to monitor those. Uh, make sure they're not getting, uh, you know, too hot. Um, there is a definition within, uh, you know, the kind of overarching requirements for skilled nursing facilities to have a safe and comfortable environment, and it defines those temps as 71 to 81 degrees inside. Now, does that mean if it's 82 degrees, it's unsafe? Well, probably not. Um, but you have to have a process to be able to monitor that to make sure that if it does rise above that, you're at least monitoring the resonance for heat-related uh, conditions. So, um, there, you know, there's tons of things. Now, if you're already doing symptom checks, uh, which I think is still required by the CDC, so if you're doing uh, symptom checks, this will help because you're going to be actively taking the temperatures of people's, and you can, you will recognize if their internal temperature is raising. That's one uh, you know, indicator, but there are other indicators of uh, heat related condition. And uh, certainly we've got a ton of that stuff, uh, you know, already prepared. I don't think I have to, you know, uh, teach you guys on how to understand those, but what what's equally important is that, you know, in a heat related emergency, we don't, the, the last thing we want to do is we want to evacuate folks. Uh, one, it's bad for their health uh, potentially, but one, it, it, you know, it, it, it will be impactful to other healthcare facilities that will have to absorb those uh, those residents into their space. And then we've got to worry about, you know, cohorting and quarantining and where do these residents go? So it, it would make it really difficult. So what what can we do to mitigate the impacts of, of these of heat or uh, temp, extreme temperatures? That last link on the bottom of this page um, takes you to all our collected resources on extreme temperatures. Um, if you're operating in nursing home incident command, there's already incident response guides that are um, that are built uh, for kind of uh, activities that you should be doing uh, or that you can do to kind of mitigate those impacts. Nonetheless, uh, I've included that in one of the handouts, but you can go to that that uh, link there and it has more than just the incident response guide. It has other tips, tools, and tricks, things that we've collected from a number of different agencies, not just created by CAP. So um, the other thing is if you are if you have a contract with a vendor to provide an outside service, um, especially something that you may or are likely to utilize during this time, whether it be uh, you have a contract with a vendor to provide temporary cooling systems in the event of loss of air conditioning or loss of power, uh, or if you have a, a, a contract with somebody to come in and, and you know set up a temporary generator in case your generator fails. 
Uh, if you have contracts with vendors to provide transportation uh, during evacuations, all of those things uh, require an annual kind of look back. And, and from the CMS EP rigs, you know, we know surveyors will ask for your annual, you know, updates for these contracts. Now is a perfect time to confirm these if you've not all done it already. Um, you know, reach out to these folks to make sure, you know, a lot of businesses have been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, other entities are struggling to find uh, staff. And so this, these folks from, um, you know, other types of industries are still struggling um, to come back full strength. And so if we're relying on somebody that may not have, um, uh, might, may not be as resilient right now, um, or may take some time to build back up those uh, internal resources, be able to meet your needs during the disaster, you want to figure that out now, uh, you know, rather than, uh, you know, expect something to be reliable, and then when you call to, uh, you know, to utilize that contract, it's no longer uh, in effect, um, or not, uh, or you can't use it. Um, the other thing I'll say is about temporary cooling equipment, things like portable movement cools or larger, and uh, you know, portable air conditioning units. Many of these units come with um, pretty strict installation requirements. Um, I'll just give you a, a brief example. Many of you have heard about the uh, facility in uh, Hollywood, Florida, not Hollywood, California, Hollywood, Florida, that after the hurricane, they had a number of residents pass away due to heat exposure um, or effects as, relate, uh, as it related to heat exposure. Um, those, that building in which those residents died had temporary cooling equipment connected to their generator and it was running. But that temporary cooling equipment vented all of the hot air that it was discharging into the up, upstairs space and it increased the temperatures in the resident rooms on the second floor. And so that's an example of having the equipment, but hooking up incorrectly with dramatic and, and uh, really tragic consequences. So if you use equipment like that and you plan to use equipment like that, you need to be comfortable and confident in, in how you uh, get that fresh air to cool it and then where you vent that, uh, that exhausted air. So you've got to take a look at all, the, all those things when you're in a temperature extreme. All right, let's hop to the Cal OSHA ETS standards. Um, uh, Cal OSHA, now uh, obviously the, the exception or exemption of those employees that are covered by the ATD standard, which is going to be most of your employees, but maybe not all. I want to cover this uh, just in case you have corporate offices or other offices, or you're a part of a CCRC and you have uh, other types of care. Um, this is going to apply for your non-ATD uh, employees. So um, there are there were changes to the original ETS, and I'm going to go over those uh, highlights of those changes. But if you want a line-by-line -line version of uh, of what's currently in effect now, that's in one of the handouts there, um, and then uh, the governor's executive order signing it into the into law is in the handouts. Now, if you need FAQs like Oh my God, this thing's huge. Uh, I got to read about this and figure out uh, the whole thing. So the the entire ETS standard has an, uh, a really extensive FAQs. That's the very first link. Um, I'm going to go over just the highlights of some of the changes from the original ETS and what's in place now. And, um, and then I'll just give you those highlights. And then there's an FAQ just for the revisions that were signed uh, into effect yesterday. So for um, uh, for vaccinated employees, now that re remember this does not apply in in a, a healthcare setting. Uh, vaccinated employees may go without masks if they are symptom free, um, regardless of whether they have been um, uh, a close contact with a um, a COVID positive uh, person. If working outdoors, no mask is necessary, regardless of the vaccination status. And, and so where I could see that applying is if you had, uh, you know, a landscaping staff or you had a bigger campus where people worked almost predominantly outside, those folks, regardless of the vaccination status, would be able to go without a mask. Um, there's CDPH guidance on outdoor mask usage, and that's pointed to in the FAQ. So I've linked that CDPH guidance there. Um, you must document the status of or uh, a status a vaccinated status of each employee 
Uh, you can develop an employee self-attestation where the employee signs um, to attest to being uh, their vaccination status rather than you um, documenting it or having to view uh, uh, cards or having to worry about uh, you know counterfeit or, or what's accurate or what's not. Uh, you can allow an employee to sign a self-attestation. Once again, I have to clarify, this does not apply to the ATD standard. This is for other folks, but fully vaccinated employees do not need to be quarantined or be tested if they don't have symptoms, even after uh, an exposure, except during, uh, there's some exceptions for during a large outbreak, but uh, an employer must provide, an in, this is a big one, um, employer must provide, must provide an N95 mask to an unvaccinated staff person upon request, if the staff member is working indoors or in a vehicle with other people. Um, there are no physical distancing or barrier requirements requ regardless of employee vaccination status, with some exceptions, and those exceptions are, are based around whether you're in a current outbreak, and then they would be adding those barriers back in uh, for the duration of the outbreak. Employers must evaluate ventilation systems to maximize outdoor air and increase filtration efficiency. Um, that is really undefined as to what the evaluation uh, it should contain. In the FAQ, it did not really go into like much detail as to what that evaluation is. Uh, but if you have uh, you know, workspaces that fall outside of the ATD standard, in those workspaces where you have uh, employees, you're gonna have to evaluate those ventilation systems and to the extent possible, maximize outdoor air and increase filtrations efficiencies. Now, uh, we just talked about how unsafe it is when it's 110 degrees outside. Uh, if you're opening that fresh air intake, you may not be able to cool the building past 90 degrees and that's unsafe. And, uh, and we, we, really, um, we really want to you know, kind of effectively uh, understand that you know, it's a, it's a flexible thing and, and where we can, we're gonna do it, but where it compromises life safety, we're, we're not. Um, and then the link to those uh, revised FAQs are right there. Um, they're, they're really extensive. They answer my questions. That's where I get most of this information. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I agree with all of, all of this, but it does look like this is gonna be in place for at least the next few months is my guess. Uh, we, we may see more later. And I see there's some questions about when is the pandemic gonna end on the chat and, and we'll talk about that at, uh, you know, towards the end here. All right, in terms of NHSN reporting, uh, uh, most of you have heard this. If you've not, the penalties were delayed for one week. That delay ends today. Um, the data is now publicly available. If you didn't know that, um, you can click on that link and you can see uh, data for every nursing home in the country, including their vaccination status. Um, what uh, my suggestion is, uh, is that uh, to have you guys log in today to make sure your dead data was pushed over and to make sure it's accurate. If it's not accurate, you guys have the ability to change that information in an NHSN system, and it essentially overrides whatever CDPH put in. Um, if you enter information in before CDPH pushes their information up to uh, NHSN, then your information will stay there. Um, the CDPH cannot um, edit information that you manually enter. Um, nonetheless, CDPH told us that they submitted data for 875 facilities last week. Um, the reason why I say, you know, check your data and let us know, because when I went and checked the data, I could only see about six, well, it's actually 681 facilities had reported vaccine data. So that's, uh, you know, almost 200 less than what CDPH said they had submitted uh, to the state. Now, when I discovered that this morning, we sent a note over to CDPH like, hey, you said 875, but it only shows 681. What's the discrepancy here? Um, a lot of that is gonna rely on you letting us know uh, the issues have not been resolved or you put in data and the data was a complete blank at CMS and, or at NHSN. That's gonna be a problem because uh, it, this uh, could constitute a, a CMP fine um, for each facility that does not report their vaccine uh, data. All right, I wanna talk about uh, how we validate vaccination status. Um, if you were on the HSAG um, uh, webinar on Wednesday, they had a representative from CARE2, like a field representative from one of the local offices, give a pretty uh, complete 
um, overview of the enrollment process with CARE. Um, the, maybe the most important thing that, that I took from that is that if you want a read-only account for CARE, uh, just want to be able to view vaccination records, it's a different enrollment process than it is if you're going to be providing vaccine. Now, if you're in Los Angeles or if you're in another county where you've already started the process to be a vaccine provider too, and you've gone through the care enrollment and you do prep mod and you all, all that other stuff or, or my CA vax, um, if you're already in that, you're, you should be able to uh, access this data already. Um, if you wanna get to that point, you can, but it's a long process to get approved to not only do the care thing, but uh, sign up for the my CA vax and, and sign up as a vaccine provider. It can be done, it does take some time, maybe a good long range strategy, depending on how long we'll need to order these types of medications but um, or vaccines. But it, it definitely, if, you, if you're thinking long range, that would be a, a good thing to do. Now, if you're in San Diego, the, the um, immunization registry is run, run through, the San, uh, through San Diego County. Now that information is uh, uh, collected uh, at that website, but you can also sign up for an, an account um, with San Diego County as well. They have an 800 or a, uh, not an 800 number, but they do have a contact number listed on that link there at the bottom, as well as a contact email address. I'm sorry I didn't uh, I put it in there. I should have uh, put it in there, but certainly if you click on it, you can find that information. In the following counties, Alpine, Amador, Calaveras, Mariposa, Merced, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Tuolumne counties, you can call for immunization records or you can send an email to support at myhealthyfutures.org. Uh, you know what? I cut off that that <laughs> that phone number. <laughs> That's terrible. I, I apologize. Let me get let, let me get the uh, the phone number. Actually, Summer, can you do me a favor? Can you Google uh, my healthy futures and uh, get the phone number for the immunization records? And I'll repeat that on <clears> the chat at the end. That that'd be great. That way, I don't have to uh, stop this the slides from going. So. Sounds good. All right, so um, the other thing is if an individual um, person in the community, um, you know, a lot of talk about verifying vaccination status of uh, visitors, um, not just uh, new admits or, or new staff that we hire, um, anybody can go obtain their authorization, their uh, vaccine, vaccine records directly from CARE. Now, how long that process takes, I don't know. So on, on Wednesday, when, when, I, when she gave that information, I went in that instant and I went to do my own record just to see how long it would reasonably take you guys to get a response. And I've yet to get a response. So uh, this is two days later, I'm still waiting. So yes, you may be able to utilize that service, but it's not gonna be an instant service. It's gonna be something that's gonna be uh, take time. Just today, um, this may all go by the wayside. So just today, there's a, a, a new website that's available and I've confirmed that it works and I got my shot records in about 30 minutes. But if you go to that website, myvaccinerecord.cedph.ca.gov and you click on it, fill out some real basic information and they will need your phone number or they need the phone number that you used or, or I believe that um, the email address you, you gave the immunizer when you got your shot records, and then it will pull that up by your date, date of birth, and either one of those two uh, pieces of information. Now, I'm certain there will probably be, uh, you know, errors in that, but just from my personal experience, I went to that when I got the press release. I put in my information. 20 minutes later, I got a, a text message with a link. I clicked on the link, and it gave me a barcode showing the two dates and the type. A vaccination I got. It, it was by far and away the easiest way to confirm vaccine that I've seen uh, that's not the white card. So if you're looking for a way to uh, quickly verify these records, my hope is this will, will get us there. Now, of course, I've said that and everybody's going to overload the system and, and we're not going to be able to access them, but my hope is this is going to be much more uh, effective at, uh, at getting those authorizations. Now, the person from CARE did mention that we should not be asking people for their vaccine record. Um, we should just be asking them if they've been vaccinated um, and uh, if they offer um, to let us 
view their vaccine records on care, then we could do that, but we couldn't um, solicit them or say it's a condition of their visit that we have to verify their vaccination status. And I think that was real clear. We want to make sure that we're not doing that. Uh, you know, It just dictates w what the terms are when they come in the building rather than whether they'd be able to visit. All right. That was all we've got to. I've got a ton of questions. So uh, hopefully we'll get through some of these questions. Uh, I know a lot of folks have questions about the previous AFL. So I, I want to get to that uh, as well. So give me one second while I open this the question box and get to the top here. All right. So one of our first questions was who declares that the pandemic is over? Uh, well, th the national public health emergency will probably end uh, and, and that'll be when the president essentially, or the director of health and human services makes a recommendation to the president and the president would uh, would remove that. Um, if they wanna do it sooner, generally they'll pick a time and date in which it would um, have to be renewed uh, for some of these things and then they'll just uh, you know not renew them. Now in our state, because we've walked through a, walk to the beat of a different drummer. I'm not certain that our governor would remove the state of emergency within our state, um, uh, but it, it, it's possible it could all end at one time. But uh, traditionally the public health emergency, quote unquote public health emergency is set by HHS and it's signed by the president and then they would be the one to end it. We may continue in a state of emergency in California past the end of the public health emergency federally. Uh, and, and I. I don't think it's a stretch to think that uh, that could happen just based on the conservative nature that we've experienced uh, thus far. Are face shields still mandated in SNAFs based on their county tier status, required in green zone if facility is in an orange, red, or purple tier? That is what Dr. Epson said on last call transit, but I'm unable to find this in the AFL. And you're right, it's not in the AFL, but it was what Dr. Epson said, and that's, um, any county with a substantial or moderate or substantial rates of, of spread. Now, I'd, I'd have to go back to see if that includes orange or not. I thought it was just red and purple, but it, it may be orange as well. Um, and there's quite a few, there's like 14, 12 counties, something like that, still in orange. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, Dr. Epson is the one that really kind of sets the guidelines for the state. I don't want to say sets the guidelines, but she's clearly the number one subject matter expert at the state. And when, when she says something, it's generally, uh, it's right on. And, and it's because she's the one that wrote the guidance. So anyways, um, all right. It, next uh, question, let me hop down here. Can we maintain an overall facility requirement that fully vaccinated residents of fully vaccinated, or fully vaccinated visitors of fully vaccinated residents must keep face masks on at all times? The AFL says may, uh, not must or shall. Um, you know, it, that's that's up to you guys. I, I certainly think it's within your um, your ability to write it into your uh, policies and procedures. You just have to maintain consistency with the, the elements that you've indicated. Uh, you know, I don't, the, the only problem I see, you know, um, is you could have a fully vaccinated visitor make a, a, a complaint um, about that if they're really um, not keen on wearing a mask. And so I, I worry about from a, a resident rights standpoint, but outside of that, um, you know, I think an argument can be made that out of an abundance of caution, you want to keep everybody with face masks on in the facility, regardless of vaccination status, for another couple months or something like that, or put a limited time on that. Uh, where you can revisit it. I, I don't think it's disallowed. Uh, it's just that, you know, there, there are conditions where you might run into um, uh, residence rights issues um, by asking a vaccinated um, resident that doesn't want to wear a mask, wear a mask. So that's my main, main, main con concern. So CD, uh, CDPH data was not accurate. All right, well, that was the first push of that. Okay, so when does CDPH push the data to NHSN? If they push the data related for this week, next, uh, are we considered timely? Yes, so the, um, so today, the it should be updated with information that was collected between uh, the 8th and the uh, 14th. So it will be the June 8th through the 14th, 
um, or, or 7th through the 13th, sorry, 7th through the 13th, and that should show up on, uh, on the NHSN website today. It hasn't this morning, or at least it hadn't prior to the start of this webinar. Um, but it, anyways, it's, uh, it goes from a previous week, and then there's like a um, CDPH ends their week. They send the data in, to NHSN on Thursday. NHSN is supposed to publish the data on Friday. They have not published it yet this morning, but we should see the the data uh, today that would indicate folks uh, were compliant. Now, uh, if you if this was a first time that you recorded the uh, vaccine data, uh, we'll be able to take a look to see how many uh, errors we have. Um, my estimation it was a couple hundred or very close to that, but. That's considered timely. See, uh, NHSN is is not penalizing you for when CDPH uh, sends the data over, and CDPH confirmed that in their notes. And if you if you download the notes from the last CDPH call, it is going to be in the notes that exact answer. So, all right. I, hey, Jason, I just want to ask about visitation for SNF. You said we go by 2022 instead of. Uh, 38.7 that would have us limiting visitors still asking about cruises travel my understanding was that since we are in low transmission area and high vaccination rates we can have visitors screening and masking high and hygiene um, depending on uh, what your what what type of facility you are if you're a skilled nursing facility I promise you that does not apply to you uh, and, and I've heard that right from the uh, you know the horse's mouth so to, so to speak and and we have that in writing uh we we told them how uh, ultimately confusing that is to say that it applies to all, all facilities and then three sentences later in the AFL say but for these people follow this and then to completely exclude the ICFs altogether was really confusing so i don't know that they're going to recall the AFL but my guess is they're going to update it based based on how confusing that that can be um but for sure uh we confirm with them the SNFs and the ICFs still have to follow their sector-specific guidance. All right. Can we start implementing testing guidelines from AL 2053, or do we need, yes, you, uh, if you're in Los Angeles County, according to Dr. Nye, uh, she definitely said uh, in Los Angeles County, you have to postpone uh, operationalizing both the testing and the visitation AFLs until they release uh, county-specific uh, requirements. Sadly, um, you know, that hasn't uh, happened. I, I talked to Dr. Nye last week and my assumption was that it was gonna come out this week and I was a little disappointed to hear it would not be released. Um, I will send an email to Dr. Gounder this afternoon and ask him if we can get a forecast or some kind of update to see how long this is gonna take. All right, um, I've got some other questions that, that I'd like to just kind of go over that people had submitted to me that I think um, other folks may have questions about in in regards to uh, you know kind of the testing AFL. So one of the questions was, can we use antigen testings um, to do uh, either the diagnostic screening testing or the uh, response testing? And the answer was yes to both, surprisingly. But the testing now needs to be done twice a week. While we already knew uh, diagnostic screening testing could be done. Um, with the antigen test if you did it twice a week. But now uh, CDPH has said that you can use that testing, um, you know, in your response testing as long as you're testing them twice in that week. Um, another question was, uh, per the AFL, response testing in residents and healthcare professionals must occur every three to seven days. If we test every three days, that means four rounds of testing will be completed over 14 days. Is that accurate? And the uh, CDPH had responded, yes, it was accurate. Uh, it wasn't a mandatory requirement that you test every three days. That was just a recommendation. But it, at a minimum, you have to test every seven days with the PCR test. And then, of course, if you're using the antigen, it needs to be done twice. All right. Um, do we need to test our dialysis residents weekly? Now, this is different for Los Angeles County, so you got to take this with a grain of salt because they have specific requirements for testing dialysis residents. We anticipate that's going to change when they change their overarching uh, uh, guidance. Um, but this applies to any any resident who leaves the facility for di dialysis. They, they do not need to quarantine uh, unless there was a known exposure at the dialysis facility. When there is suspected, um, you know, COVID transmission at the facility, then of course we're going to do testing immediately. 
14 day quarantine um, uh, recommended for partially or unvaccinated people. And you may consider periodic, periodic diagnostic screening testing for those folks uh, who regularly leave, but it's not a mandatory requirement, except in Los Angeles County, which we know it does. Some other counties, I, I don't wanna jump ahead of myself, some other counties may have specific stuff as it relates to the dialysis folks. And if, if you uh, if you know your county has that specific guidance, I don't know that it would be um, uh, usurped by the answers to the, this question. So I still think you would need to follow your county specific guidance if it's more conservative. All right, um, and one of the big questions was how do, uh, you know, when we calculate our vaccine percentage for staff, what is considered staff? The easiest way to um, uh, to answer this is to take the last part of the answer that they gave. Yes, include registry, payroll, contract services, physicians that entered the facility that week. Now I asked Dr. Epson, uh, you know, in the entrance, uh, in the, in an instance where we have a contractor or some outside vendor that has no uh, interaction with residents. Let's say you hire, a, I don't know, an HVAC contractor and they're replacing the air conditioning unit on your roof or something like that. Would they need to follow this same um, kind of prescription? And she said, no, you would not need to put them in the testing pool uh, or anything like that. They would still be subject to the same requirements for anybody entering the building, you know, uh, you know symptom check, uh, things like that, uh, they're, they're obviously wearing source control throughout, staying six feet, uh, performing hand hygiene upon entry, all that all that same stuff would apply, uh, th but they would not need to be included in that um, the vaccination rate uh, and how we calculate that stuff. Um, another question was, do we need to have a CLIA waiver in order to use the Bionex now? Um, yes, and you, you can apply for a CLIA waiver now, um, if you've not already done so, we've, we've covered that extensively. But uh, rather than that, if you think you, you want to sign up for a CLIA waiver, if you send me an email, I can get you the links. I don't have them uh, off the top of my head, but I'm happy to give you the links on how to sign up if you haven't already. All right. And uh, sadly, there were not a lot of good um, answers for those of you that are in distinct part SNFs. Um, it sounds like CDPH is, is under the assumption that the uh, population is getting vaccinated at a rate that's high enough that eventually that requirement to have 70% of your residents vaccinated is going to be less and less of an issue. I, I don't know. I think we, we should probably revisit that in a couple of weeks or once we have, um, or maybe a month once we have some better data. But right for right now, sadly, I apologize, but I was not able to get them to change that. And I have notified the hospital association because I know uh, DP SNFs are often uh, um, represented by both of us, so if they can utilize any kind of leverage they have with the, the department, maybe we can get some action. But as of now, um, no, uh, there is no accommodation if you're a DP SNF. Sorry. All right. And then I want to get to some questions on group activities because I thought they were uh, pretty good. Um, and they're ones that I, I have seen frequently. Um, here's the question. If 10 employees are fully vaccinated and meeting in a conference room or a break room, and there, are they still required to maintain six foot distance or, and wear a mask? Answer, no, if all the staff is fully vaccinated, they can take off masks and do not have to physically distance if they are together in a meeting or break room, as long as there are no unvaccinated healthcare personnel or residents in the same room. No, this is important. So note that healthcare personnel always have to wear a mask when they are in the presence of residents, regardless of vaccination status. So that's a good, a good, a good one uh, to take. Uh, there was also an, a great question about an activities person uh, singing karaoke. Uh, vaccination status would absolutely matter for me. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Epson said, you know, you want to be cautious about that. Certainly, singing is one of the um, uh, one of the activities that we can do that produces the most aerosols. And so, if that person you know, is unvaccinated and um, I, I'd have a little more concern, but if they're being tested frequently, I think we have some level of confidence, especially if you're doing it a minimum of twice a week, you know, might be safe to do it, but still, uh, you know, um, we, you know, we we'll try to avoid that if we, if we can. Um, now, if the person has been vaccinated, I'm much more com uh, comfortable with that. Um, 
I don't think it's likely that uh, secondary transmission is as big a risk. Um, so I, I would say that would definitely be a, a, a difference maker for me. Can fully vaccinated residents stay in masks and not distance while dining if an unvaccinated healthcare personnel wearing a surgical mask is serving the residents in a dining room? And I 100% can see this happening in just about every facility. Um, aligning with CMS and CDC, here's the answer that they gave. If an unvaccinated healthcare personnel is taking part in the activity, then fully vaccinated residents will have to wear a mask. If the unvaccinated staff member is just observing or overseeing from afar while wearing source control, then the fully vaccinated residents do not need to wear a mask. In the scenario mentioned, the unvaccinated healthcare professional is serving the residents, which is not considered actively engaged in the activity. So the residents do not need to wear a mask. All right, so hopefully that answers some of the burning questions that you guys had. Um, I thought those were all good concrete answers. Uh, sometimes they dance around stuff, um, makes it hard to operationalize, but those were concrete things that we can um, we could take in effect. Now, though, they post those questions either today, um, they uh, either today or on Monday, and um, and those questions will be uh, they come out by Khan Alert uh, for the the notes. If if you want a copy of these, I have a draft of it. It's not the final version because they they send it out to each one of our participants and they ask us to edit the answers. Um, so I don't have the final edited version. I don't see anything that needs much editing in here, so it's pretty well baked. If you send uh, me an email, J Belden, my last name's uh, B E L D E N, J Belden at CAF.org, C A H F.org. I'll send you a copy. So anybody that sends me an email and asks me for a copy of all these, because I, I just handpicked about uh, five of the questions. There's literally like 35 or 40 in there. They're all filled with good information. So send me an email and I'll get you the, the notes as quickly as we can. So, all right, guys, well, I, don't, I didn't even check time here. I figured we'd be done early and we're at 142. If you guys don't have any other further questions, oh, can you put a direct link reviewing the list of SNFs that shows? Oh, you know what? I'll go back up to the, uh, that's real, before we go. Uh, so if you click this data, I wonder if, it, I'm not sure you guys will be able to see this, but maybe you will. Um, are you able to see that on my screen, Summer? Yep, I can see it. Okay. So if you scroll down to the, the, the data set, there it shows all the skilled nursing facilities in the country, uh, total resident deaths by state, uh, percentage of current residents and staff with COVID uh, vaccination. This, uh, the top metric breaks down residents and the bottom metric breaks down uh, staff. So as a staff, we're right at 73% as a state. Now that's only about I don't know, 680 facilities that I see represented in that report. So obviously there, it could be wildly skewed next week based on the addition of 600 more facilities. And as a, as a state, California, uh, for va resident vaccination is at 76%. And once again, that's only showing 680 facilities so far. If you want detailed breakdown uh, state by state where, where it says summary table, and I'm, I'm not sure if you can see this over, over here on the side, but there's a, a thing here that says view source data. You can download uh, uh, the Excel spreadsheet and and also as well, uh, you know, kind of divide it up by state. You can find your uh, your uh, facility information by just doing a search, uh, all that stuff. So you can pull up anybody, any facility in the country. Now you can get this data on as long as they've reported. Um, so you should be able. To, now this is the public facing site. Now, if you want to verify your data, you need to go to the NHSN site, and and maybe that's what you were looking for, Kevin. I'm not sure, but um, uh, I didn't have that link on on here. But you definitely have to go into your NHSN and log in to verify that your uh, your results showed up. All right, so hopefully that um, that gets all the questions answered. Uh, as always, you, you guys have my email address. Uh, you can always email info at calf.org if you have a generic uh, question and you don't know who it goes to. Uh, you know, I, I just cover emergency preparedness. We have lots of other staff here. So certainly you, uh, you know, feel free to email that with any questions you have. So hopefully I'll get some emails from you guys. I'll send you out those notes. 
you have a great weekend. Try to stay cool. Uh, take care, and we'll see you on the 25th. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.